والله يدعو الى دار السلام ويهدي من يشاء الى صراط مستقيم الله knows what's best for us so why should we complain we always want the sunshine but he knows there must be rain We always want the laughter and the merriment of cheer But our hearts will lose their tenderness if we never shed a tear So whenever we feel that everything's going wrong It is just Allah's way to make our spirits strong. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to Inspirations. All praise is due to Allah. We praise Him. We thank Him and we seek His aid and we ask for His forgiveness. We seek the protection of Allah from the evils of ourselves and the evil consequences of our actions. Whomsoever Allah guides, none can lead astray. And whomsoever Allah leaves to go astray, none can guide. I bear witness that none has the right to be worshipped, but Allah alone who has no partners. And I bear witness that Muhammad وسلم, is his servant and his messenger. Welcome to a new episode of Inspirations. We're still trying our best to get personally involved in, to, in the life of the Prophet wasallam, trying to get ourselves committed to each and every event in the seerah, trying to drag lessons from it, trying to relive it. And hopefully this will increase our iman, our faith and our knowledge about Islam and will add to our character and our personality as Muslims. Last time we were talking about the very beginnings of the Battle of Badr. The moments, the very moments, just before the battle started. And we closed the episode when we mentioned or when we touched on the event where the Muslims were standing in very well organized rows as the Prophet ﷺ organized them. But yet one of the companions, one of the great companions of the Prophet ﷺ was feeling uneasy. He wasn't, wasn't feeling so confident. That person was Abdul Rahman ibn Awf. He was standing in the row and he looked to the right, and then he looked, looked to the left and he didn't feel well. He didn't feel really confident. So what was the reason for that kind of feeling? Is it some kind of cowardness as some people might think? Was Abdul Rahman ibn Awf not confident that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give them victory? What was the reason? Let's ask Abdul Rahman ibn Awf himself. Abdul Rahman, Abdul Rahman ibn Awf says, when the Prophet ﷺ organized us in rows, uh, in very well organized, uh, well organized row, just before the Battle of Badr, I looked around me. I looked to the right. I saw a teenager, a young man. I looked to the left. I saw another teenager. So I felt uneasy and I really wished that I were among or between two stronger men. Because it depends who's around you. Sometimes, especially in those old uh, battles, when people used to fight with the swords, the people around you really made a huge difference. Because if they were weak, it means the army or more people from among the army will be able to get to you. So you will have to deal with more individuals. So Abdul Rahman ibn Awf was feeling uneasy. But these two teenagers did not give him the luxury of entertaining such a thought about them. The first one on his right asked him a question in secret. He didn't want the other one to realize what he was asking Abdul Rahman ibn Awf about. So he said, Uncle, can you tell Abu Jahl, do you know how he looks like? So he was first shocked. Why do you ask me about Abu Jahl? He asked him. The young man or the teenager said to him, I heard that he abused the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So I made a pledge to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala.
If I get to see him, if I get to see Abu Jahl, I will not leave him until one of us dies, until one of us kills the other. He was shocked to hear something similar. At, the, at that very moment, the other one on his left, he said to him, Uncle, can I have a word with you in private? So he said, what do you want? He said, do you know Abu Jahl? Can you recognize him? Can you tell Abu Jahl if you see him? He said, yes, of course, because he was from the Muhajirin. But these two young men, these, these two t- teenagers were from the Ansar, from the people of Medina. Abdul Rahman ibn Auf said, yes, I know Abu Jahl and I can tell if I see him. So he said to him, if you see him, let me know. Let me know and show him to me. Again, he was surprised. And he said, why are you asking about Abu Jahl? He said, because I heard that he abused and he hurt the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And I made a no, an oath to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. That if, if I see him, that I will not leave him alone until either I kill him or he kills me. Imagine. These were the teenagers of Islam. These were the young men. I'm talking about people about 13, 14, 15 years old. The Prophet ﷺ did not allow the young men to take part in the battle until they have reached puberty. Actually, Abdullah ibn Umar wanted to go in the battle of Badr, but he was around 13, 14 years old, and the Prophet ﷺ did not allow him to go. So how old these two teenagers were? Maximum, they would have been about 15 years, each one of them, around that age. Imagine we're talking about 15 year olds and they have such dreams. These were the heroes of Islam. And this is how we want our teenagers to be. This is how we want to bring up our children to be similar to these people. People who lived for a message, people who lived for a mission, people who realized the position, the high position of the Prophet ﷺ. So they were re- ready, each one of them was ready to sacrifice his own life for the sake of defending the Messenger ﷺ. Because Abu Jahl really abused the Prophet. May the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. These were the heroes of Islam. And this is how we want to treat our children. This is how we want them to be. And unfortunately today when we look at the way we raise our children, the way we bring them up, the way we teach them, the way we educate them, the impression we give them about life is, and I sadly say that, is distant from the manner or the methodology of the Prophet ﷺ and his companions. Those young men were cultivated and were taught and were educated to realize that they live for a reason, they live for a, a great purpose and a noble purpose, and that is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone, to defend Islam, to spread Islam to the rest of the world. And even if this means to lose one's life, that's a very cheap price. And that's a very easy price to pay in order to make it to paradise. This is why the companion's children grew to be among the best generations of Islam. These young companions, they were the best. And they were the ones who spread Islam around the world with a good word. Yes, they were defending Islam. They were defending the truth against the vicious enemies. But all the lands they reached, all the lands they managed to get to, the people of those countries were flooding into Islam when they saw the great examples, when they saw the great characters the Muslims had when they realized the beauty of Islam, when they realized that this is what, what they were created for, to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. And this is how we want our younger generations to be. And this is something that has to be realized and has to be understood by parents, fathers, mothers, teachers, people in the field of education have to understand these principles. They have to have some kind of a similar target to bring up our children, our younger generation, in the best way possible. 
Now look at how we bring up, bring up our children. We leave them to TV because the, the father has to work, the mother has to work, the mother cannot stay at home. She cannot put up with that. Because if she goes to university, she spends a few years in university. When she finishes, she says, I didn't waste four or five years of my life just to sit at home. So who does she leave her children to? She leaves her children to TV. So the TV cultivates and brings up her child and formulates the mentality, the outlook that her children have or develop about this life. And to maids, to nurseries, and unfortunately in our countries, we have to be clear, we have to define our problems. I'm not trying to be pessimistic. We have to be optimistic, but in order to treat the illness that we go through, the illness that we suffer from, the illness that keeps us down, we have to define it. And then we have to treat it with courage, with determination, and with honesty. The people who work in the field of education are not properly appreciated. Teachers receive very low wages. So this is why the people in the field of education are not the best in our societies. So this is why education is not improving. It is not improving. And who sets the curriculum? There are very serious studies about the curriculums and the rapid change in the way our curriculums are organized in the Muslim lands. The changes sometimes and one year in one of the Muslim countries for four consecutive years the curriculums have changed and those some people made studies about that and the conclusions they came up with is that these curriculums and so much money, millions were paid to change these curriculums rapidly and consecutively over a period of four years. And some serious changes happened. Sometimes a whole book would be changed only for a few words to be altered. In order to change, the, in order to change and mold and mutilate the concepts our children have about certain things. This is a very serious thing. So who do you leave your children to? We have to take our responsibility seriously. We are responsible for our children. Many people like to pass the blame on the system, on the educational system, on schools, on the curriculum, on the society as a whole, and they say, well, we don't have other, another choice. No, you have the choice, and you own the final word on this. Who will bring up your children and how? You leave them to TV, most of the... TV channels that are directed to children, the cartoon, uh, the, the cartoons they have and all the other programs are designed in a way to create some kind of strange creatures, some kind of freaks who will not hold any light for Islam in the future. Don't leave your children to these channels that are dedicated for children. Most of them are damaging to the character and to the religion and to the heart of your children. But they are the easy way out because we are busy. The father has to work all day long and then in the evening he has to spend some time with his friends. The mother is the same. She needs to socialize. She needs to live her life, enjoy her life. So she just throws her children to TV. That's the third parent. Actually, actually, it has become the first parent. And some statistics indicate that in the Muslim world today, children between 3 to 10 years old, they watch about from 3 to 4 year, three to four hours of, they watch TV 3 to 4 hours daily, on a daily basis. So imagine what kind of concepts they are exposed to on a daily basis. And how long do you speak to your child? What's, you know, the time that you spend with, with your child, how long that is, how many hours these are. And they're not as constant, they're not as uh, extensive and deep and thorough as the concepts that they learn from TV. So what kind of future that we are, we are expecting for Islam? If we commit this crime 
against our children, leaving them to TV, leaving them to an educational system that is not up to the level of the challenges that we have, not up to the level of the great position of our Muslim nation. When are we going to wake up? We have to make it. Many people will say, I know, alhamdulillah, and I really praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, many of our viewers are uh, well-educated, are aware of the challenges they face and their children face. And I know that, inshallah, they are determined to have the final word and to uh, rise up to the level of the challenges that we face in terms of cultivating and educating our children. Don't give up. Your children are the assets for our future. If we lose them, we will have a very dark future, even worse than the times in which we live today. That's our responsibility, and we will be held responsible before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the Day of Judgment about that. Many people, and I, I say this as a point of criticism, I'm directing it to myself, to my brothers and sisters, especially those who work in the field of da'wah. Many of those who work in the field of da'wah, they direct their attention to da'wah outside home. But don't forget, charity starts at home. And actually this is not charity, this is an obligation. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask you first about yourself and about your family, the people under your responsibility, the people who you are supposed to look after, the people who are, whom you are supposed to cultivate, educate. These are your first responsibility. These are your first priority. After you fulfill your obligations towards them, then you can move on, inshallah. And Allah will give you success in that. Because this is how we progress. But sometimes you find people successful in da'wah, but their house, their home is corrupt. Their wives, their spouse is not or they are unaware of their responsibilities as Muslims. Their children are in the worst situation. They are the worst example for children of a person who is in the field of da'wah. So this is a lesson we can take after we have seen this example of these two young companions uh, who were standing just next to Abdul Rahman ibn Awf. They are Mu'adh ibn Amr ibn al-Jamuh and Mu'awwidh ibn Afra. Teenagers who were real heroes better than men at our times. Hopefully we will be able to cultivate our children in similar ways, to be people of a great mission, a great vision about the world, about their, the reality of their existence in this life and their responsibility to the Muslim nation and to humanity as a whole. We will carry on, inshallah, to try to take more lessons from these important events after this short break, so stay tuned. It is just Allah's way to make our spirits strong. It is just Allah's way to make our spirits strong. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to Inspirations. Before we proceed, I would like to remind you to write to us on our email address, inspirations at huda.tv. Your contributions always add to the show. Sometimes we don't get to reply to your emails, so we apologize about this. But we do take your emails seriously and we benefit from your comments and your suggestions. Uh, we just talked about the example of the younger generation among the companions, how great they were. And uh, this took us into a, a journey into how to look after our children, how to bring them up and how to help them to grow to be better Muslims who really understand the responsibility, uh, the responsibility towards Islam, towards humanity and uh, which makes them a people or people of a great mission, people who hold the message of Islam to the rest of uh, the world. Now, as we 
are still in the camp of the Muslim army, let's make a transition, let's move to the camp of the Kuffar on the other side. Let's try to find out what's the atmosphere, how are things, what's happening there, how are things going there. Okay, uh, two weeks ago we talked about uh, the great and the very frustrating to the disbelievers obviously, but it brings so much hope to the Muslims, the frustrating kind of argument that happened between Utbah ibn Rabi'ah and Abu Jahl and how the mushrikeen, how the polytheists were divided were divided amongst themselves, they did not have the same word, they did not have the same opinion about the war and the way Abu Jahl acted in order to provoke Utbah and to incite the rest of the mushrikeen to go into the war, to go into the battle with high morale and strong spirits. Let's try to see what Abu Jahl is doing now. Abu Jahl at this moment makes or does something very strange, very surprising. Abu Jahl, the one who worships Hubal, Allat, and Al Uzza, Mana, all these idols, the one who fought the Prophet ﷺ and challenged him for the sake of these idols, Abu Jahl makes and does something very strange, something unaccept you know, unexpected. What is Abu Jahl doing? Abu Jahl turns away from all the idols, he puts his hand up, his hands up, and then he says, Oh Allah. He supplicates Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He calls upon Allah. He forgets all about the idols. What is he trying to do? What does he say? He says, Oh Allah, the one who has started this thing, the one who has started the, this whole issue from the beginning, and the one who came to us with something that we don't know, and he divided the family amongst themselves, Oh Allah, destroy him. The one who has connected the relations between or among the same family, oh Allah, destroy him. Make him or make him the loser. Abu Jahl is turning to Allah. Does it did does it mean that he has come to Islam? He started to, you know, come to terms with Islam, to become more convinced about Islam? Obviously not. Abu Jahl was more wicked to ad a level that he could never accept Islam because he knew for sure that Islam was the truth but he didn't want to embrace it. But what was his intention behind that? His intention was to deceive the people around him, the mushrikeen. Because after that argument took place between him and, between, and Utbah ibn Abi Rabi'ah, some people felt a bit hesitant about fighting their cousins, fighting their kins, the muhajireen who were among the Muslims. Because they were hesitant, he wanted to raise their morale and to convince them to fight and try to give them the impression or put them under the, under the impression that you are on the right, the Muslims are on the wrong, so you will win. Don't worry about that. He was trying to give them that impression, so it was more about media. It was more about deception. It was a trick by Abu Jahl himself. So he said, Oh Allah, the one who brought us something we don't know about, something we don't recognize, and the one who has disconnected the relations between the same, or among the same family, among the members of the same family, destroy him and make him the loser. He was pretending as he is the one on the right, he's the one who worships Allah, and that Muhammad came with something new, something unacceptable. He was trying to put his people under this impression that they were fighting for a just cause. But Muhammad was not. Obviously he was pretending. Pretending to be the person, the good person, who really cares for his people, and who cares for the truth, and who cares about the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I could expect somebody like Umayyah ibn Khalaf. And if you still remember, let's go some time back. If you remember, we mentioned the story about Sa'd ibn Mu'adh when he went to Mecca to make Umrah, and Abu Jahl saw him making this tawaf, and he was actually, Sa'd ibn Mu'adh was a friend of Umayyah, and Abu Jahl said to him, you came to make, you, you have the, uh, the audacity to come to Mecca and make Umrah, when you have provided shelter to our enemy, to Muhammad, he said to him, if you prevent me from making Umrah, I will prevent you from something worse, I will cut off your way, or the way of your trade to Asham, to the north, to Syria. 
So Umayyah ibn Khalaf, although being the friend of Sa'd ibn Mu'ad, he said to him, don't speak like that to Abu Jahl. He's the king, he's the leader of this town of Mecca. So Sa'd ibn Mu'ad said to him, he just come off it. I heard the Prophet ﷺ saying that they will kill you, that you will be killed by the Muslims. So sin, ever since, Umayyah has been living in complete and devastating fear that he could or he was going to be killed by the Muslims. This is why he didn't want to go in, in the Battle of Badr. He tried to stay at home, but Abu Jahl dragged him. Abu Jahl cornered him and he said to him, he called him a coward. So he caused him, he forced him to join the army of, the, of Quraysh in order to go and fight the Muslims. So I could expect now, when Abu Jahl was making this supplication or pretending to make this supplication, that Umayyah was looking at him, realizing how wicked he was, how hypocritically he was behaving, and that he was the worst liar in Mecca. I could imagine Umayyah looking at Abu Jahl saying, how wicked you are, how evil you are, what a, what a big liar you are, ya Abu Jahl. He could, I could expect him doing that because he wanted the war to come to an end so he, there were no chance for him to get killed. He wanted to run away. This is why he bought the best, you know, a very expensive camel that could run very fast so he could run away from the battle, you know, if need be. So, that was the case and that was the whole atmosphere in, uh, among the camp of Quraysh. And don't forget, uh, after Abu Jahl uh, spoke very harshly to Utbah, saying to him, you are a coward and you are behaving cowardly, you are one of the leaders of Mecca and you are saying let's not fight them, that's because your son is in the camp of the Muslims, his son Abu Hudayfa, the son of Utbah, he was in the camp, of, he was a Muslim, because you realized your son was there and you know that the Muslims are very easy prey, they're very easy target. We can overcome them easily because we outnumber them. So you are worried about your son. This is why you want to run away from the battle. You are a coward and he called him names and he actually abused him. Utbah became very angry. He was provoked and Abu Dhal knew exactly what he was doing. He knew how to provoke Utbah and how to provoke the rest of the army of Quraysh. He knew what he was doing. He was acting very cleverly. So he said to him, you are acting cowardly. You shouldn't do that. And you will carry this, the shame of what you are doing now for the rest of your life. He called him some other bad names that I can't really mention here. So Utbah became very angry, he screamed and he tried to put a helmet on his head but his head was very big that he couldn't find any helmet to suit his head. So he brought a piece of cloth and he wrapped it around his head and then he screamed, Shayba, come join me. Shayba was his brother, Shayba ibn Rabi'ah, the brother of Utbah. Walid, his son, let's go and start the battle. And Mainly that was a tradition. Every time two armies met, there would be something called an opening combat. Three or a few fighters from each army would have combats before the two armies would meet. So Utbah stepped forward. He called his brother Sheba and he called his son Utbah. And they stood before the army of the Muslims. Three from among the Muslims stepped forward as well to fight them and to combat with them. So these three people were from the Muhajireen. There were two brothers, Auf and Mu'awwid, the children of Afra. Auf and Mu'awwid. Their younger brother was one of these two teenagers who were standing next to uh, Abdul Rahman ibn Auf. That was the younger brother, but these were older than him. Auf and Mu'awwid, the children of Afra, and the third person was called Abdullah ibn Rawaha, the very well-known companion. So they stepped forward to face these three leaders of Quraysh, Utbah ibn Rabi'ah, his brother Shayba ibn Rabi'ah, and the son of Utbah as well, 
Al-Walid ibn Utba. When Utba saw these three people who said, Who are you? He didn't recognize them. They said, We are from the Ansar. So he screamed and he said, Oh Muhammad, send us our rivals from our own people, from Quraysh, from our cousins. These are the ones we want to fight. So these three companions from, from the Ansar withdrew based on the, compa- based on the command of the Prophet ﷺ. And the Messenger ﷺ said, Hamza, Hamza stepped forward. To face who? To face Utbah. Hamza, the brave man, the lion of Allah and his Messenger. Ali ibn Abi Talib, Ali stepped forward. Ubaidah ibn al-Harith, their cousin, stepped forward. Three people from the family, from the household of Abdul Muttalib. Ali ibn Abi Talib tells us the story. He said, three, the three of us stepped forward. Hamza fought against Utbah. Straight away, he killed him. He finished him off. He said, I took out his brother Shaybah. Straight away, he killed him. The third was Al-Walid, the son of Utbah, against Ubaidah ibn al-Harith. Each of them stabbed the other. So it was a very kind of equal or even battle, even combat. So Ali ibn Abd Talib said, both of them stabbed each other and they fell down. So we rushed, Ali and Hamza, they rushed to Al-Walid and they killed him. Now the morale of the Muslims was up. They rejoiced. We've won the opening combat of the battle. These are the early signs of victory. So the Muslims were so happy. They rejoiced. They were full with confidence, trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They they realized that they were going to win the battle. Imagine the leaders of Mecca, Utbah ibn Rabi'ah, Shayba ibn Rabi'ah, Al-Walid ibn Utbah, were killed. A very overwhelming victory right at the beginning of the battle of Badr. So the Muslims were really happy. They couldn't wait to start the battle. The mushrikeen felt really down. Their morale went down. They realized that the Muslims were not an easy prey. They were not, and it was not going to be an overwhelming victory for the people of uh, Quraysh. So these are the three heroes of Islam, Hamza, Ali, and Ubaidah. They managed to take out the leaders of Mecca. The Muslims now couldn't wait to start the battle. And the Prophet ﷺ gave them the glad tidings that really helped them to raise their morale even higher. He said to them, there will be angels, a thousand angels fighting along with you. In this battle, and he came, to man, he came to them and he said to them that Allah has promised me to give us victory today. Imagine yourself standing in the army of the Muslims, seeing these, this opening combat being won by the Muslims, seeing the mushrikeen feel, feeling down. The Prophet ﷺ, who doesn't speak from his own self, he speaks revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying to you that we will win the battle. That's the first battle between Islam and Kufr. And we are going to win that. And the martyrs, anyone who dies in the battlefield, they will get so much privileges, so much great bounty from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They will get their sins forgiven. And they will see their place in paradise. They will be saved from the punishment of the grave. And they will be saved from the extreme and overwhelming fear on the day of judgment. And they will be intercede for 70 of their relatives. They will be given 70 of the Hur al And they will not feel the pain of death except like they feel the pain when, some, when one of them is being stung by an insect. Imagine the Muslims hearing that. Then the Prophet ﷺ actually, you know, because the people of Badr, these are the best of Al-Islam ever. The Prophet ﷺ one day asked Jibreel alayhi salam, he said to him, you know, the angels, or uh, Jibreel himself asked the Prophet ﷺ, he said to him, how do you 
value or how do you see the people who took part in Badr? Ya Muhammad. How do you see them? Where do you place them? What's their position among you, among the Muslims? The Prophet ﷺ said they are the best among all of the Muslims. Jibreel said, likewise, similarly, the angels who took part in the battle of Badr, they are the best among all of the angels. Imagine the Muslims realized that. And at that moment, the Prophet ﷺ gave the Muslims a very beautiful statement that caused the Muslims to win the battle. What was that statement? We will find out after this short break. Stay with us. It is just Allah's way to make our spirits strong. Oh, 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 oh. The Muslims in particular will uh, have very good knowledge of Islamic religion and Islamic law and then will run their lives according to the injunctions of Allah. It will enable them to know how to live peacefully with them and at the same time practice Islamic religion or follow the injunctions of Allah as requested and required by the Allah. <laughs> Just Allah's way to make our spirits strong. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to Inspirations. And we are still trying to study the life of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we are now at a very critical moment, very important moment, one of the most beautiful moments in the history of Islam. We are still talking about the battle of Badr, one of the most important events in the history of Islam. And we said that the two armies were about to meet, the opening combat was for the Muslims, they won that, so the uh, spirit of the Muslims was really high, whereas the Mushrikeen started to feel their weakness and that things were not going or were not in the direction or were not in their favour. So their morale started to deteriorate and go down. The Prophet ﷺ encouraged the Muslims, telling them about the martyrs, about martyrdom and what's awaiting those martyrs and how great the reward will be. And uh, uh, he promised them victory from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he told them that the angels are fighting with you. So don't worry about the issue of number. Don't worry about the issue of equipment. Just put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You've done everything you could and that these are the conditions for you to get victory. As soon as you attach your hearts to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam at one moment he said to the companions, ila Stand up. Let's fight. Start the fight and move on to a paradise, to a garden whose width is more than that like the, of the heavens and the earth. So the companions were really moved at that moment and each one of them was ready to put his life for the sake of Islam, to sacrifice everything he had, even his life and his wealth for the sake of Allah in order to get that great reward, this great and wonderful paradise from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of the companions looked at the Prophet وسلم, taken by surprise after the Messenger وسلم, said to them, move on to paradise whose width is more than that of the heavens and the earth. He said, its width is, is more, he exclaimed, its width is more than that of the heavens and the earth. The Prophet ﷺ said, yes. So he said, bakhin, bakhin. The Prophet ﷺ said to him, why do you say bakhin, bakhin? It's a word just said, it is said at times when, when one wants to exclaim about something or wants to express surprise and admiration. He said bakhin, bakhin. The Prophet ﷺ said to him, why do you say that? He said, no, I'm just, I just wish I will be one of the dwellers of, of paradise. The Prophet ﷺ said to him, you are one of them. You will be one of them. So this 
companion was taken by happiness. We will come back to him to see what happened to him. But let's see what the Prophet ﷺ is doing at that moment. He went in front of the first row of the Muslim army and he faced the mushrikeen and he held some pebbles in his hand. He threw them in the direction of the disbelievers of the army of Quraysh and he said to them, Shahat al wujuh May your faces turn pale. May your faces turn pale based this was based on a command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then he said to the Muslim, to the Muslim, to the Muslims, move on to them, march forward, let's fight them. And he gave them the direction. He said, if they overwhelm you, what you do, you resort to the archers, throw them or shoot them with, uh, or the archers should throw their arrows on them. That was basically the, uh, the similar, ex- uh, you know, concept of the plan the Prophet ﷺ resorted to. Once that started, Umayr ibn al-Hamam, al-Hamam had some dates in his pocket. He took them out, he started eating them. Then when he saw that the battle has started, he said, if I were... They were, they were few dates in his hand. He's the one who, was the, who the Prophet ﷺ said, to whom the Prophet ﷺ said, that you will be one of the dwellers of paradise. His name was Umayr ibn al-Hamam. So... He was eating some of these dates. Then he looked at the dates and he said, if I were to wait until I finish eating these dates before I get to paradise, that's a long life. How long that would be? A few minutes? To him that was a long life. So he threw the dates and he straight went into the middle of the battle, into the middle of the battlefield, fighting until he he was killed and he became a martyr. That was one of the great companions, Umayr ibn al-Hamam, showing the Muslims yearning for paradise. How much determined they were to get to paradise. They had no attachment to the pleasures of this life. The battle started, fighting was everywhere. Imagine 300 people fighting against a thousand people. What kind of battle that was? It was a very difficult battle for the Muslims. But don't forget, with the Muslims there were more numbers. The angels were fighting along with them. Just let's have a look at the scene in the middle of the battle. Hamza. Some of the things that would capture our sight would be Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib. Hamza was fighting bravely as a lion. He was fighting against the mushrikeen and he was destroying them one after the other. No one could stand in in the face of Hamza. With one hit by his sword, he would kill a person. Move to the second one, move to the third one. This is how Hamza was. To the extent that Umayyah ibn Khalaf was taken by fear when he saw Hamza. And don't forget last time we said Hamza was recognized by an ostrich feather on his chest. So Hamza was destroying the mushrikeen to the right, to the left. Forward, he was destroying them. Umayyah ibn Khalaf looked at him and he was taken by fear. And he said, that's the one who gave it to us. That's the one who, destroys, who destroyed us. That's the one who killed us. So Umayyah ibn Khalaf was taken by fear after seeing uh, Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib destroying the mushrikeen because he was one of the bravest among the Arabs in the Arabian Peninsula. One of the people who fell uh, or whom Hamza killed was Tu'ayma. Tu'ayma, uh, the brother of Al-Mut'im ibn Adi. Al-Mut'im ibn Adi is one of the per- people who, one of the mushrikeen, he died as a mushrik, he died as a non-Muslim. He was one of the people who helped the Prophet ﷺ in Mecca at certain, at difficult times. But still he died as, uh, as a non-Muslim, and here his brother was fighting against Islam and he died. Hamza killed him in the battle uh, field. Now let's go back to Abdul Rahman ibn Auf and the two teenagers. Let's see what was happening. They were fighting in the middle of the battle. All of a sudden, Abdul Rahman ibn Auf looks in the, among the mushrikeen. He sees Abu Jahl. And Abu Jahl was surrounded by a huge number of the mushrikeen. But he could recognize, he could see Abu Jahl was there. Abu Jahl was called by the people in Mecca. They, he was called Abu Hakam. Abu Hakam means the father of wisdom. But actually, he was the Muslims called him the father of ignorance, the father of uh, 
of uh, uh, the father of lack of reason because jahl it's about you know the father of oppression these are all you know contribute to the meaning or const- the meaning of jahl constitutes that uh, so abdul rahman wa'af saw abu jahl so he started looking around where are the two teenagers he looked at them and he found them he said to them you see that guy who's standing there in the middle among the mushrikeen has been surrounded because the mushrikeen say protect abu al-hakam protect they mean abu jahl protect abu al-hakam don't let anyone get to him because he was their leader they don't want to, to lose the leader so abdul rahman ibn auf said to these two teenagers you see that guy there in the middle they said yes he said that's your friend that's your man go and get him so he only he's just finished this word and they all hastened to abu jahl both of them now uh, muad t- tries to tell us t- tries to tell us the story muad ibn afra tells us the story and he says uh, when Abdul Rahman Abu Awf first told us about Abu Jahl, I went straight to him. I tried to get to him, but I couldn't because the mushrikeen were surrounding him, trying to make a shield, a human shield against uh, around him. They wanted to protect him. He said, but I found my way through and I got to him and I hit his shin bone and I caused his leg to fly. And actually it flipped and it was tossed in the air and he fell. And then I couldn't do anything because the son of Abu Jahl Ikrimah, he hit me on my shoulder with his sword and he cut off my arm. My whole arm was cut off and it was still hanging, was held by a little piece of skin, was holding it. So he said it was hanging and I spent some time fighting while my, while my other hand was hanging, my other arm was hanging. And then Mu'awwid, the other one, the other young man, he managed to get through to Abu Jahl when he fell down after he's been hit and he lost his leg. He went to him and he managed to stab him with his sword a few times until Abu Jahl couldn't you know, resist, but he was still alive. He left him, still he was breathing. He left him and he ran away because it was very difficult to finish him off because he was very well armored. You know, he, he was... Uh, wearing an armor, a full armor. So it was very difficult to kill him, especially after the mushrikeen were determined to protect him. So now, Abu Jahl, the one who persecuted the Muslims in Mecca, the one who tortured many of them, the one who killed many among them, he's the, he was the one who killed uh, Sumayya. May Allah be pleased with her, the mother of Ammar ibn Yasir. He stabbed her. And he killed her, and he, after, after torturing her, her husband and her son, and many other Muslims. All the oppression that Abu Jahl has caused the Muslims, or has practiced against the Muslims, now he's paying the price for that. Now all the uh, pride, all the arrogance of Abu Jahl has fell on the ground, is covered with dust after being stabbed and being taken out by two young Muslims. These are the heroes of Islam. Abu Jahl now was left alone, in the dust, bleeding, unable to move, unable to defend himself. Where is his idols? Where is his pride? Where is his arrogance? It's all gone forever. And the same destiny awaits all those who oppress Muslims, all those who fight against Islam and prevent the people, prevent humanity from realizing the reality about Al-Islam. Now here we have to close. We are still in the middle of the Battle of Badr and hopefully inshallah next week when you join us we will carry on and we will learn more about the events in the Battle of Badr. So don't forget about that very critical moment we are still in the middle of the battle and we will try to maintain our spirits high we will try to still keep our emotions and our hearts and our love with the Prophet ﷺ and his companions fighting in this battle against the mushrikeen until then Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Allah knows what's best for us so why should we complain
We always want the sunshine, but it knows there must be rain. We always want the laughter and the merriment of cheer, but our hearts will lose their tenderness if we never shed a tear. So whenever we feel that everything's going wrong, it is just Allah's way to make our spirits strong and the merriment of cheer. But our hearts will lose their tenderness. If we never shed a tear, so whenever we feel that everything's going wrong, it is just Allah's way to make our spirits strong.